Hey, this is Chelsea Dupre, co-host of Girl Hustle. Thanks for listening to the following podcast on Public House Media. Two beauties and head cannons, where we're nerdy and you probably are too. We have a fantastic episode set up for you here today, talking about video games and their movie counterparts. Um, just a very quick first announcement, though. Um, I just wanted to announce this on the show. Um, I will be um, updating our social medias as well, um, but I've kind of made it no secret that I'm trans, non-binary. It's come up like I think a couple of times here and there <laughs> and um, in the course of like socially transitioning and everything like that I've decided to change my name because I'm much more comfortable with a neutral name rather than a very obviously femme gendered name and so from now on I'm like I said I'm going to be updating like our social media pages and everything like that but uh, the new name I've chosen is Tegan that's how I want to be referred to as um, pronouns aren't changing right now um, just the name. So if you, you know, hear somebody say something about Tegan, if you hear Lindsay start calling me a different name than you're used to, that's why. So that's all. I just wanted to give a quick announcement. <laughs> and with that, um, Lindsay wanted to talk a little bit about cosplaying in Geek on Fleek. Oh, yes. I actually wanted to kind of segue into the whole social media thing because I've been doing all kinds of cool stuff on social media lately on my own personal page, and I kind of want to blend it out into Beauties and Headcanons. Um, I actually did a podcast um, nerdy-centered photo shoot this past weekend, and it was so much fun. I really was trying to get uh, new pictures, uh, new headshots for our social media page because those pictures are probably almost two years old now. (laughs) And Elizabeth is, Elizabeth, oh my goodness, Emily has been gone for a little while. So um, it's time to update that picture. And my hair has probably gone through several different colors since then as well. So it's time to update all that. I got some really cool like Pac-Man and Star Wars t-shirts that I borrowed from the boyfriend and had a really good time um, posing in front of murals in Dubuque, Iowa um, with an amazing photographer in that area named John Potter. And we had so so much fun. Um, so that was a really cool experience, and I'm going to try and bleed that out into it. But what I wanted to talk about about with Geek on Fleek this week is that for the very first time, I'm going to a convention, and I'm actually going to cosplay as a character. But it's not that exciting. Um, <laughs> we, uh, My boyfriend Jason and I decided we're going to cosplay as um, Linda Belcher and Bob Belcher yes. from Bob's Burgers. Yes! <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so it's going to be an burgers, aged so. version. I bought like a gray wig. Yeah. So I, I bought a gray wig. I have to butcher it a little bit tomorrow because I need to make it a little bit more retro flippy. I couldn't find like a gray flip wig. I really think she'd go all gray. So oh, yeah. I need to do that. And everything else should be pretty simple. But what I did think was pretty interesting about cosplay, and I'm hoping that I'll be able to actually sit in on a couple panels about um, shape and inclusivity with cosplay, uh, but what's going to be really fun is I, I like the idea of making it a character who ages and changes and is actually someone you would see out in real life, and um, in making these uh Cosplays. We, we were trying to figure out like how they would look as they got older, and um, would their styles change at all? Would Linda's butt get bigger? That kind of thing. So um, we're going to have a lot of fun doing it. I will definitely have pictures. Um, if any of you have any suggestions or have had any uh, cosplays that you've done that you changed a little bit from the from the source material. I would love to see the pictures or hear about it. So please let me know. And with that, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about source material in a different way, I guess. <laughs> um, quick question. Are you going to be doing that cosplay at C2E2? 
Where is that going to be yeah. for yes. Heather? Oh, oh, a segue into the fact that, like, in two weeks, we're going to have a C2E2 episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this will be the second year that I've gone. And this year, I'm actually going to cosplay, which is really cool, too. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And Adam Savage is going to be at the C2E2. I think I might have said that a couple of episodes ago. I'm not sure. I was pretty pumped. Um but we're going on going down to Chicago on Saturday, and you guys will get to hear all about it in a, in a week or two. Yes. Um, I actually have an interesting connection from C2E2 this year that you're going to, and our episode as well. So that's going to be... Oh, okay. it's, awesome. it's a very It's a very tiny one, but I um, was kind of like putting together some thoughts and everything or <laughs> like in my head, and I was like... I stumbled upon the little bit of information. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. Like, I knew it, but, like, I didn't consciously think about it and connect the dots. I'm like, okay. So, yeah, it was kind of interesting. Sure. Um, Anyway, we've talked kind of extensively about, you know, movie adaptions, normally talking about, like, adaptions from books um, or book series, you know, is in the case of you know, like Game of Thrones or something like that. Um, And I mean, there's been Mm -hmm. tons and tons of adaptions, some good, a lot of them not so good. (laughs) Um, And we've talked about, you know, what makes a good adaption, what doesn't make a good adaption. And uh, I I can't remember exactly where the seed of this idea kind of came from for this episode, but I, I was talking with somebody. I know it was somebody, either my husband or one of my friends. And... It, it kind of came up that, you know, the video game adaptions are actually usually pretty much critically not so good. <laughs> you know, like, it's really, really hard to even think of a good video game movie adaption. And I'm just kind of, like, I was kind of curious at the time, like, you know, I wonder why that is. And I think I may have stumbled upon it. I don't know. But <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> okay. So, like, I mean, the first um, one that, like, immediately comes to mind, and it is actually, like, decent, I guess I would say, in, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's, like, necessarily the best ever or good, but I, it is decent, and that's Silent Hill. Um, it has, it does have Sean, the movie does have Sean Bean in it, which, and he doesn't die, surprisingly, I know, wow, uh, but... I kind of, you know, looking back at that movie and like, you know, why it was good and what made it interesting, I kind of realized that, you know, Silent Hill, the movie didn't really have a whole lot to do with Silent Hill, the game. Mm -hmm. Like, like it had the whole, you know, foggy, thick fog atmosphere and it had Pyramid Head. Um, But aside from like a very few, like minor aesthetic things, it seemed to be like its own little story. And I think that's kind of what almost worked in a way was that it didn't try to directly adapt something. It tried to do its own thing and try to make it a little bit more original instead of following something so faithfully that it becomes... Very closely, right. Yeah, it becomes unpalatable in a movie sense. I feel Um, like what was cool about that was um, in in Silent Hill, the movie, mm -hmm. the main... um, character is a female uh-huh. and in the game it's a male mm-hmm. and Sean Bean's character really is like kind of a side note because when yeah. they were originally writing the script they had decided that there was too many female characters in it like there was no mm-hmm. male presence so they ended up having him in there and um, his tidbits of the movie though don't really bring the plot along yeah it's sort of like a like an extra added bonus to see him not dying in a movie yeah. i suppose um it's like he's but, on the outside of this yeah whole but story it's also sort of like like the same setting but a very different story is going yeah, on exactly um, we just don't really get to see that much of it at least from his perspective we're mostly following the perspective of somebody else Right. And the thing is, like, I I had heard a few different reviews on Silent Hill, the movie versus the game. And, um, you know, the game came out when we were relatively younger. Mm-hmm. And I remember being petrified. I It wasn't the kind of show or I'm sorry, the kind of game you wanted to play um, in the dark. Oh, no. <laughs> at night. 
alone with your headset on and the volume flipped all the way up. It just wasn't that kind of thing. Um, unless you like being scared and then <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Um, but for it being an adaptation from the, the source material being like the actual game and then the way they made it into a movie, um, it, even like the rights that it took, it took them a long time to be able to actually make the movie mm-hmm. um, from what I was reading. So yeah. it's really interesting to me that they went in such a different direction with the storyline, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, you know, the people who had played the game wouldn't have wanted to watch the game that they just played on the movie screen. Yeah, because they already know everything that's happening, more or less. Right, and there's a part of me that almost kind of feels like that's where some of these other video game to movie adaptations went wrong. Yeah, is when you try... It's it's a very, like, delicate balance, is trying to be faithful to the source material, but also, like, trying to do something a little bit new. And, like, I, I'm kind of on the fence as to whether I like Silent Hill the movie as a Silent Hill movie, or if I think possibly changing up a few things and making it wholly original could actually serve it better. But, you know, as an adaptation, I think it's probably one of the strongest, more or less, just because... Yeah, of... I think that... Sorry, the, the part of it that was so strong was the setting, I think. Oh, because yeah. Because it was, it was a little weird trying to transfer the backstory... Mm-hmm from the game into the movie and then back again. Like, it just... There was some uh, continuity issues there as far yeah. as it being the same place. Um, and it it had, like, all the makings of a good horror uh, scenario. Uh-huh. It just... Something... They could have They could have made a decent, scary movie without calling it Silent Hill, I suppose. Yeah, like, it... <laughs> Yeah, like, it, um, I, I think they had a lot of good concepts, and I feel like they were going in the right direction, but I I feel like they almost, they, it's like they almost got scared and kind yeah. of took a step back, and they're like, oh, no, 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 we're going too far out of our comfort zone, <laughs> you right. know, whereas if they took that step, it's like, well, who knows, it, it might it might not have been a good step, but it might have been a good step. We obviously won't really know, so. Well, right, and we don't know what that process was and yeah. how it how long it took them or what kinds of steps they did take, but, mm-hmm. it, yeah, I feel like there was kind of like a, like a hesitancy. Yeah. <laughs> to what they were doing. Oh, definitely. Um, I did want to talk at least briefly about probably the most panned video game movie out there. Okay. Like, probably one of the worst. And this is where my C2E2 connection comes in, and that's the movie based on the video game series Blood Rain. Mm. And it's it's based in... Well, it's supposed to be in, like, 18th century Romania, but, like, with the costumes and everything that is going on, it's like... It's... It's like it's trying really hard to be a period piece, but it's not actually putting in any effort to be a period piece where, like, you know, say somebody who isn't even all that familiar with, like, costumes and clothing and, you know, habits of the 18th century, they're going to look at this and they're going to say, yeah, that is not accurate right. at all. Like, they have the <laughs> costumes, but none of, none of the mannerisms or anything like that? Um, well, no, not even that. I mean, like, <laughs> like Rain okay. is wearing this crop top, <clears throat> corsety top and pants, and I guess because it's, like, has these ties, it's supposed to emulate, like, corsetry tying. Or something, I guess. I don't know. But, like, it's it's just so very obviously not it. And the funny thing is, is it was the... Mo- well, the first movie, at least, was released in 2005. Yes, they somehow made, like, two other movies <laughs> based off of Blood Rain. Why? I have no idea. But, like, the first one was released in 2005, but, like, watching it, or if you're in, uh, in my case, watching, like little scenes of it on YouTube because I can't bring myself to watch the whole thing. (laughs) Um, it's, it has very much like a nineties aesthetic almost as far as like, kind of like a cheesy over the top, over dramatic kind of factor. Like, Hmm. does that make sense? (laughs) 
Yeah, I think so. And you know what's funny is a lot of these are going to have that kind of a yeah element to them too. But I on mean, the other hand, like most of these that have that element were actually made and released in the nineties. And okay. this was released yep. in 2005. So it's like, it's yeah. like, it, it's like the, it kept that old video game aesthetic, but it didn't try to update or do anything else with it. And it, it's, it's just a mess. It's a complete mess. Uh, was there I, a plot to the movie at all or like a it character was, development or anything? There, it was centering on Rain, which I mean, the Blood Rain series does center on. She is like, right, a, right. she's a kind of like Blade where she's half human, half vampire. And okay. so she's, you know, hunting down her father, the vampire king, and, you know, trying to, you know, get vengeance on him. And it, it's all kinds of, like, really nonsensical little plot things that happens, like, along the way. Like, you know, typical just 90s, 90s schluck, you know? Sure. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, it's so funny. Like, I had posted, you know, our little promo about... Uh, this episode on our social media and like right away almost literally within minutes of me posting it on Instagram somebody commented oh I commented oh I hate the Blood Rain movies and like this is this is how strongly like people feel about these movies like it it is not good um Laura Bailey who is going to be at C2E2 she voices Rain in the video game series and oh, yeah okay. so she was asked in a panel in 2000 2007, so like a couple years after it was released, um, what her thoughts were on sure. it. And this is a direct quote. She said, oh God, that movie sucked. And that movie was so bad. I saw it on the movie channel and I couldn't even get through 20 minutes of it. It was so bad. And it was kind of sad oh. <laughs> that they took that because I really liked the games. <laughs> yes. Like, ooh. Well, in, in my research for this too, I you know went on Amazon Prime to see if there were any movies that were able for me to watch. Uh-huh. And that was the only one that was on Prime that I could watch for, for you know, my Prime membership. And I was like, <laughs> Maybe I won't. Yeah. <laughs> it's I had not heard worth such, it. Uh, poor reviews of it. So uh, it, it is yeah, very, yeah. very um, apropos, the poor reviews. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's pretty much just like a, a, a perfect storm of just awful. It's uh, done by Yu Bol, um, like directed everything by Yu Bol. It has um, poor Michelle Rodriguez. I feel so sorry for her because <laughs> she was she was also in Resident Evil, um, mm. another video game movie adaptation. I, I swear I, I don't know what it is about her with these. She tends to take roles that are just not really that great. I don't know. But you know what's funny about Resident <laughs> Evil is she really really wanted to be in that movie. She. Yeah. Her, she told her agent, and her agent, like once he, they found out that there was going to be a Resident Evil movie, they wrote her a bigger part. Oh yeah, in Resident Evil, just so she could be a bigger part in it. Oh yeah, like, and, seriously. And granted, like her role in Resident Evil is overall much better than that in Blood Rain, right? but although that doesn't really say that much. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> what what character did she play in Blood Rain? Was she Rain? Oh, no, no, no. Um, oh, okay, good. No, no, no. <laughs> no, say, she was... Um, uh, I'm trying to remember. I honestly can't even remember her name. But it, it wasn't... It, I, I think she was a member of uh, a different, like, a Brimstone Society, which is, okay. like, you know, kind of anti... I, th- I believe they're, like, anti-vampire and stuff like that. And so she, like, doesn't really sure. like rain and stuff like that. So... Kind of like going at odds with the main character. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, So let's talk about Resident because I remember at least a couple of the movies. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the game came out at a similar time to Silent Hill, perhaps? Yeah, it was was around that time. Resident Evil, the game, was just really, really kind of pushing the boundaries a little bit with, like, their horror genre. Kind of taking okay. it in really interesting directions and, you know, introducing all kinds of concepts in there. Um, it, one of my favorite, you know, things about the games itself, and also one of the most frustrating things, is a certain character called Nemesis, which is just this huge hulking character that is just hunting down these different stars units uh, members 
and he is just such a pain in the butt <laughs> to fight against. But it, he makes the game so interesting, even without really saying hardly anything other than stars. He creates this presence that this intimidating presence that you're almost constantly looking over your shoulder for. And he doesn't get introduced in the movies until I think like the second or maybe third movie. But uh, I think what they tried to do was like more or less make like an origin for him. But Nemesis, I don't think is one of those characters that really needs an origin. Like he works better as just this, messed up monster you know we don't need to see who he was before we don't need to see his transformation or anything like that we just you know we want to see him and right and I, I don't know it's it's one of those where they I think they kind of tried to do a little bit Silent Hill style where they tried to go in their own direction a little bit but I don't think it worked as well for me. Like, I enjoyed the first movie well enough, but the more it went on, it it's like the more it just doesn't work for me. I don't know. Maybe it works better as a standalone, the first one. Well, see, I was listening to a few reviews on the movie, um, on the movie franchise, because uh-huh. there's quite a few of them. Um, and Mila and her husband actually are like a big part of the mm-hmm. whole uh, franchise. They, he was the director or producer or something, and then they got married. They ended up having children, mm-hmm. and she was a force to be reckoned with. Um, at the end of the first movie, she's still wearing that red dress, and she's uh-huh. all bruised up and... Um, and hurt, and she did a lot of her own stunts. So a lot of that's not makeup. Those, oh yeah, a lot of those bruising and and all of the color on her is real, which is really kind of cool. It makes her quite like a force to be reckoned with. Yeah. Um, and I, I felt like other than Fifth Element, we really hadn't seen her in anything else. Was it her in Fifth Element? Yes. I always thought it was. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Gosh, I didn't want to name drop and be wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I kind of now at this point only ever think of her as, um, you know, in Resident Evil. So I I don't really remember seeing her in anything else. And it's kind of who she's always going to be to me. Yeah. But I feel like there was some weird continuity issues with the movies um, that kind of strayed away from the game as well. And as far as, you know, them being a game to movie adaptation it was more yeah like you were saying had they had they been standalone from each other it would have been probably a slightly more enjoyable thing um yeah. i know quite a few people who actually said like they didn't get into beyond the third movie mm-hmm. like you know it's it's hard to get beyond a trilogy like you just yeah. lose interest and there's only so much you can do with a storyline like that yeah that keeps people interested um but there was also a writer involved who had, like, a different story um, with, you know, like, an underground base and people who were doing genetic um, testing mm-hmm. and that it went wrong. And they, they really did sort of, like, smash the two stories together of Resident Evil and this guy's brainchild. So I thought that was kind of cool, to, but at the same time, like... Maybe that's where they went wrong. Like, if you try and put too many elements into something and you don't give people closure or an endpoint in a storyline, it's really hard. Like, had Raccoon City just sort of been it, Dunzo, Mm -hmm. give me a couple movies, maybe I would have had a better chance of liking it. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, you have this whole problem and issue that you're going throughout the movie trying to like solve and trying to overcome and then like by the end you do it and it's like oh Mm -hmm. yay we won or you know we did it or whatever and then it's like you turn around and oh bam whole new issue whole new movie you know right right exactly it's, it's it becomes exhausting for an audience to continually sit through that same kind of shtick over and over and over and not lose interest 
Right. Is it different though when you're playing a game like that? I think it is because you're more directly involved in it. it. You know, you're not just watching the action; you're actually doing it yourself. You're actually, a part of the action. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I mean, because I mean that has been the formula for certain game series. I mean, God of War actually famously at the end of two, uh, two ends when you actually gather up all the titans and you're climbing Mount Olympus to go after Zeus, and boom, that's where it is. Right. Right. <laughs> And, but, um, you know, it works effectively because, again, you you have this personal stake in it. You're the one controlling it. You're not just watching it. Yeah. You know? Well, in, in that vein, let's talk a little bit about um, fighting games because there yes. were a couple of those that were all about fighting. Oh, and yes. <laughs> then they made the movies and the movies were like this. Okay, which one do you want to talk about first? <laughs> um, well, let's let's talk about Street Fighter first because Mortal Kombat is actually getting a new movie that's coming out next yeah, year. Yeah, okay. So we'll talk about Street Fighter first a little bit. Um, now, Street Fighter and Tekken, Tekken has also had a movie. Those are the games I play kind of a little bit more casually. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm not like super familiar with like their stories. I know that obviously there are stories going on behind all the fighting. Um but I'm not as familiar with their lore as I am with Mortal Kombat. But I have seen, like, at least some of the Street Fighter movie. And oof. Just big oof. <laughs> yeah, well, I <laughs> I had sent you a synopsis of uh-huh. that movie. And I was like, is this really something that anyone would want to watch? Like, why would Jean-Claude Van Damme even... <laughs> say, yeah, I want to be the title bad guy in this. Like, come on. Well, he was the good guy. And the reason is because the, oh, role, the role was literally <laughs> written for him. Oh, God. It was it was written to be a Jean-Claude Van Damme role. Oh. That, that's what it was. And so... That's awesome. So, I, yeah, I mean, really the only gem that came out of that movie was Raul Julia's final performance as M. Bison. And, I mean, in the games, like, M. Bison is just this bad dude that you just absolutely cannot stand. His attacks are insane and just ridiculous. His AI is incredible. And it, it's so satisfying when you do beat him. But in the movie, like, you are full on ready to just hate him on sight. And Raul Julia comes out and he (laughs) does his thing and you're just like, I love him. I absolutely love him. (laughs) Only Raul could do that. Yeah. I'm sorry. (laughs) So I, um, I don't know. I... I'll admit, I think I watched my older siblings play the fighting games. Um, I remember Street Fighter like maybe my brother is fighting against each other or maybe like my friends. I don't know. But I, I remember like the sound of what it sounded like when a fight started. Um, I know when I played, I was always trying to play like the, a female that didn't look like they weren't wearing anything, <laughs> oh, good which was <laughs> relatively difficult to do. Um, but I don't remember the game having any plot. I remember it being kind of like, a throwaway fighting game. And I will admit I've never even heard of Tekken until today. So, <laughs> um, um, well, the thing about at least like the older fighting games is like a lot of their plot and their story happens like you know back then they didn't have like you know the cinematic capabilities that video games sure. today does. And so they would have um like in between their screens you could have like a little like plot of text telling like the context and then at like the end of a certain tower you would have like an ending that they would give so that's how they kind of told the story around the fighting um that's they say they they did the same for Tekken and for Mortal Kombat too so okay in the early days of the fighting games it was kind of a little different telling a story that way and but these days, obviously, they've kind of progressed past that. You know, the games nowadays, they have, like, cut, proper cut scenes and dialogue and, you know, actual stuff going on, like, in the game itself, other than just the fighting. So, right. It, it's kind of, that's kind of naturally evolved. The movies, though, ugh. Like, I mean, again, it came out in the 90s. You know, you got that typical 90s cheese going on. And, I mean, I think also a part of 
mm-hmm. a part of it. It's kind of like a perfect storm where, you know, you don't have quite the makeup and CGI that you really need for certain things. And you also don't necessarily have the budget for certain things. And maybe you don't have access to the best writers. So, but you still want to put something together. And I, I kind of understand that in a way is like, you know, you really want to get this story out. But when you rush it and when you push it too far too fast, it, it, it doesn't work, you know, as we can see by the early Mortal Kombat movies, by, you know, Street Fighter, by Tekken. Um, now, Mortal Kombat has, is going to get a movie reboot that's supposed to be shooting this year. I don't think that they have, um, I, I don't know if they started shooting yet or not. I know they've solidified most, if not all, of the cast, um, and the movie's supposed to release next year. So I'm kind of curious if, you know, like how different it will be, and if there's going to be any difference in, like, say, the quality of the story that they're telling this time. Because, right, right. you know, uh, you know, Mortal Kombat has, over time, you know, kind of gained a good reputation now, thankfully, after Apocalypse oof <laughs> um, yeah very glad it has you know gotten a much better reputation after that yeah, and you know people also always like they actually seem to like the first movie and the second one's like not yeah. even a little bit and so I'm, I'm kind of curious you know with this potential availability of you know better CGI better makeup are mm-hmm. they going to have access to better writers too? You know, I, and how, how good are these actors going to be? You know, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, uh, fair about Liu Kang because I never really liked Liu Kang. But, uh, you know, some of the other characters, I'm kind of curious, you know, how, how they're going to, how they're going to do on the screen. Because, you know, these are, these are ones that I, I have seen in video games that I love and that I adore and that I, you know, want to see treated properly. So mm-hmm. that's, you know, something that a fan of the series is going to come in and see and judge it on. And it would be kind of cool that with our technology and advancements and resources, if they could, um, you know, treat them well, mm-hmm. um, you know, with all with everything that we have at our at our potential now, mm-hmm. as opposed to how poorly things were treated in the past. Yeah. So. Where, you know, things like comic books, you know, they weren't really given much of a time of day in, you mm-hmm. know, the eighties and nineties, you know, that they, they made movies, then they were just, you know, these cheap, cheapo things that they just threw out there. Whereas nowadays comic book movies are big money. So, right. you know, maybe right. as Hollywood kind of gets the idea that, Oh, well there's, you know, treasure trove of comics. There's also a treasure trove of games out there mm-hmm. with plenty of stories to tell and a whole variety out here. So, you know, that, that would be really cool if, you know, if they want to go in that direction that, you know, they might have access to a little bit more than they would, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Right. Well, speaking of games then, would you like to talk about Gaming Corner? Yes. um, I actually had a different Gaming Corner plan, but I wanted to change it um, because I was going to talk about Bethesda and how they, you know, pay tribute to their gamers. But uh, I have to pay tribute myself because uh, we suffered a very hard loss this week. Um, Now, I apologize if I completely butcher his name, but Kazuhisa Hashimoto was the creator of the infamous Konami code. Um, the Konami code was something that developers could use when they were testing and playing out the game to detect bugs and glitches. It would basically make the game a little bit easier for them so that they could more readily test everything out. And obviously, you know, gamers got a hold of the code and, you know, made the game easier for themselves. It was just this, you know, kind of universal, um, this universal thing that you could just, you know, say to somebody or you could do in a game and, you know, it it was like an instant connection. You know, you would just say, you know, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, you know, A, B, A, Mm -hmm. start. And everybody would know what you were talking about and what it was referring to. And unfortunately, he passed away earlier this week. And it's just kind of like the feeling of the end of an era is this code was something that came into play just so, you know, fairly early on in the whole video game industry. And, you know, it's it's kind of just brings into sharp focus, like, how long video games have been a part of society as a whole and what it has, what it has done and what it has grown to and evolved into in this day and age. So I, I just did want to take a moment to say, you know, rest in peace, Mr. Hashimoto. We really appreciate everything that you did for video games as a, as a whole. 
And we will always rem- remember your Konami code. Wow. What a, what a way to end this, yeah. <laughs> this episode. <laughs> um, well, with that being said, um, we would love to hear any game to movie adaptations that we missed that you guys would like to talk about. Um, I'm sorry. <clears throat> And um, anything else you'd like to tell us, my goodness, we um, would love to hear anything that you have to say. Um, any new topics or things that you'd like me to look for at C2E2, I would love to hear um, from you listeners to us people talking to the Great Expanse <laughs> every other week. And with that, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Tegan. And thanks for getting nerdy with us here on Beauties and Headcanons. Headcanons.